Well, hello there, and welcome to this week's um, weekly installment of Bingham Healthcare's Be Informed webinar series. I'm your host, Michael Brandis, and it's a pleasure to be here today with you. I'd like to thank all of our viewers who are watching this on Facebook. Um, and just as a reminder, um, if you do want, if you are interested in this information and think someone else would be interested as well, please be sure to like this Facebook post or share it even with your family and friends. Um, the other thing um, that to note is you can also find the the Be Informed webinar, or all of our Be Informed webinar series um, on the on our YouTube page, Bingham Memorial um, Hospital's YouTube page um, has all of our, our webinars. So. Just to let, just to remind you, the reason that we um, are hosting um, these webinars is because, as you may or may not know, at Bingham Healthcare, we take great pride in our seminar series, and we used to hold a lot of different seminars throughout the region. Um, but because of everything going on this year, uh, we wanted to move to a safer, more digital um, experience. And um, just to let you know that we're in a studio where we're, so, we're socially distanced, um, six feet apart from one another, um, just to maintain um, those guidelines. Um, so the, at first, I'm, the first thing I'd like to do is welcome our um, doctor, Dr. Nathan Richardson. His specialty um, is orthopedic and arthroscopic surgery and sports medicine. Welcome, Dr. Na Dr. Richardson. Thanks, Michael. Um, and I can confidently say that I would consider Dr. Richardson to be the, um, the region's, if not the state's, number one um, orthopedic surgeon, especially in soldier, 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 oh, I can't say, I can't speak today, shoulder or, and um, elbow surgery. And he was recently um, nominated as the number one orthopedic surgeon um, by the Idaho State Journal um, for their Reader's Choice Awards. So congratulations on that, Dr. Richardson. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So... What um, I'd like to do is introduce Dr. Richardson, have him talk a little bit about himself, and then we're going to move into the Q&A portion of this webinar. Um, a lot of our viewers who follow us um, on Facebook have asked questions, Dr. Richardson, so I'm going to be asking those um, for, um, for them. And also, if you're watching this on Facebook and you didn't catch it live, you're more than welcome to ask um, questions in the comments section, and we will be sure to respond to those um, for you as well. We still want to make sure that um, we're providing as much health information um, out there as possible. Um, so, Dr. Richardson, why don't we start with um, maybe a little bit about yourself, um, what you studied for your undergraduate degree, and um, what inspired you to go to medical school? Well, uh, ooh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I went to my under, I did my undergraduate at the University of Utah, and I was in exercise science because my original plan was to do physical therapy or uh, work as a personal trainer, but the more I got into that, field, I realized that therapists often take orders from doctors, and my personality is such that I like to be at the top of the totem pole, so <laughs> I decided that uh, career in medicine was likely going to be more applicable. Okay, excellent. Um, and just to let you know, um, Dr. Richardson is board certified um, in orthopedics, and he is also fel fellowship trained in shoulder and elbow surgery, um, and that's from the Center of Orthopedic Research and um, Education, also known as CORE, um, the CORE Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. That's right. Um, Dr. Richardson, what before we get into the questions, would you like to talk a little bit about um, what specific um, specialties you um, you specialize in? Like, for example, rotator cuff repair, tibia, um, dislocations. What Could you elaborate a little bit on why people um, would want to schedule an appointment and see you? Oh, sure. So most of what I do here in Southeast Idaho is shoulder surgery because there's just a lot more volume of shoulders. I'm also specialized in elbows. So anything in the upper extremity from the elbow to the shoulder is kind of where I like to be. The um, passion that I have is actually for shoulder replacements, as these have become much more intriguing and popular. Uh, there's a lot of research going on in that right now. We've had a, uh, extreme advances in some of our implant designs that have made outcomes even greater than they were, you know, five, ten years ago. So I, I do have a, a serious passion for shoulder replacements. Now, as a shoulder expert, we do everything that you can imagine. In fact, there's a couple of procedures that I do that I don't think anybody else in the region even uh, attempts because of that, that training. So some of those have to do with a very, very rare condition um, where we have to move the pectoralis major 
and substitute for one of the muscles called your um, serratus anterior that's defective, usually from a nerve injury. The other one is something called a snapping scapula. If you've ever been told that, the, that you have this, there is a surgical solution for that. Um, but other than that, you know, the bread and butter rotator cuff repairs, instability, slap tears, bicep problems, you know, impingement, any of these things that you've heard, uh, we take care of on a regular basis. And I um, also, I was going to ask you this a little bit later um, in the webinar, but I thought this might be a good place. One of the things that is pretty, that's unique um, f for for the area, um, and I don't know that a lot of people pr have these, but you specialize in 23-hour shoulder joint replacement surgeries. Is that correct? Yeah, the uh, a lot of the advances, as I mentioned earlier, have been in implants, but uh, parallel to that, we've had advancements in pain management, blood loss, uh, control, you know, symptomatic relief right after surgery. So we haven't had to keep people in the uh, hospital as long. And so, yes, one of our goals is to try to move at least 90 to 95% of all of our shoulder replacements to what would be termed an outpatient shoulder replacement. Um, well, so it's almost as if someone could have their shoulder surgery and then be at home that same day. Yeah, we've, I've, I would say we have about 50% of them doing that now. Okay, um, excellent. And I know I, what I wanted to ask you is, um, what is your what is the, your average wait time for surgery? Well, I personally try to keep that within a month. Uh, okay. So if you've come and you see me and we decide to do surgery, we try to get it done within at least the four week period since we saw each other. There's multiple reasons for that. Sometimes the pathology changes. Sometimes um, there are timetables to repairing things like rotator cuffs, or if you wait too long, it makes the surgery a little more difficult. And then there's just the regular old, you know, patient relations. You want to make sure that you're taking care of them in a timely manner because they got life to move on with and things they want to recover from and get back to their own, you know, regular schedule. So I think treating patients in the center of your care instead of putting it off to you know, for whatever reason, as a surgeon, uh, you just make room and you make time and they become your number one priority. Okay. And I think it's important to mention at this point as well, as I know that we're nearing the end of the year and a lot of people like to have their surgeries done, um, um, based on their annual deductible. So a lot of people are trying to schedule surgeries. Um, at, it's important to mention that at Bingham Healthcare's Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and in particular Dr. Richardson, if you are out there and you are scheduled to have a shoulder surgery or elbow surgery, um, but you aren't able to have that surgery done until next year, um, Dr. Richardson is extremely patient-centered and always likes to leave a few slots available so that um, we, he can squeeze people in um, for their shoulder surgery um, by the end of the year um, if possible. Possible. So if you would like to have your surgery done this year, um, you'll want to call Dr. Richardson's office and see um, if there is some availability that would work um, for you and your schedule. Um, and again, I haven't mentioned it. Actually, not again. Um, Dr. Richardson actually sees patients in Pocatello. Uh, he sees patients at the Physicians and Surgeons Clinic of Pocatello um, off of 1151 Hospital Way. And in addition, he occasionally sees patients throughout the month um, in Soda Springs. So if either of those locations are convenient for you, um, you can schedule an appointment with Dr. Richardson. And the main number to call to schedule an appointment with Dr. Richardson is 208-239-8000. Again, 208-239-8000. Zero, zero, zero. Um, the other thing to mention today is what we um, there you can find out a lot more information about Dr. Richardson on our website at binghammemorial.org. Again, binghammemorial.org under find a doctor, you can look up Dr. Richardson's um, bio and learn about all the different surgeries that he performs and all of his specialties um, if there's something that you don't hear um, or that's not addressed here today. Okay, so Dr. Richardson, I think we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of this webinar. Okay. I have several questions, again, from viewers that have been watching um, and have been providing, um, who have been asking questions. And I just want to preface this by saying that even though Dr. Richardson is giving you um, his best answer possible um, to the question that is being asked, you should know that it should not be considered as a diagnosis. Um, you'll always want to meet with your doctor in person to be able to get a full exam um, so that you can be 100%, the doctor can be 100% sure. So this is just an in general response Q&A session. Again, you'll want to see your, um, your doctor or Dr. Richardson in person to get an actual um, 
to get an actual diagnosis. Okay, so the first question that I have here, a, a viewer has asked, I am in recovery from repairing, t um, from repairing tears in my shoulder. Is there any way to know if, you are, if I am overdoing it, even if there isn't much pain? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, a lot of that has to do with which tears uh, you're referring to. I'm going to assume that they're talking about rotator cuff tears since it's a very common injury. <clears throat> And my advice to my patients is that pain is usually your best guide. Um, the type of pain is always a little difficult to describe sometimes, but I usually tell patients if it's a sharp stabbing pain, that's likely not a good thing. But if you have some dull, achy muscle soreness or stiffness, that's very common after a shoulder surgery. And the further you get away from your surgery, the less and less of that you should have. Uh, the biggest caution I have for people in the post-operative period is just to not trip, slip, or fall. And I think I tell my patients that four to five times from the time I meet them to the time they're done recovering. But if you can stay off the ground and avoid gravity, you're likely going to do fine, whether you have dull, achy pain or not after your surgery. Pain after rotator cuff repair is very, very uh, variable. There's a large amount of you know, normal pain after there. So sometimes it's really hard to describe that. But as long as you're uh, within, you know, a tolerable range and you're not having, you know, mechanical type things happen to you, like falls, or if you feel a pop that remains painful uh, more than 24 hours, that's usually a sign that something may be wrong. I would report that to your surgeon immediately. Okay. Um, the next question that we have from our viewer, from our viewers, is my shoulder surgery has has fixed my dislocation issues. However, within the last year, the pain has worsened. Could it just be scar tissue? Uh, I can get to the point where I can't move my shoulder at all. Uh, so shoulder instability is a mixed bag as well. It's really um, all over the board sometimes with with people's response to the shoulder surgery to stabilize it. And some of it has to do with how young you are, how long the dislocations have been occurring, how many that you've had, what's the type of procedure that you had performed, because there's more than one for shoulder instability. And uh, the, the, the real tricky part is you can develop arthritis in your shoulder, unfortunately, if you've had a long history of instability as well as multiple dislocations and you're a little older, like you know, above 30 to 40 years old, if you've been dislocating for 10 or 15 years, the cartilage unfortunately can wear out. So even though you've stabilized the shoulder, that arthritic condition will continue to progress. And with that kind of question that he's asking or she's asking, I would anticipate uh, that'd be my biggest concern is that you've developed arthritis that's now causing your pain rather than an instability. So. You shouldn't continue to have pain after the shoulder's been stabilized if everything's going correctly. Stiffness uh, after shoulder instability surgery is, is fairly common. There's a balance between stability and motion in the shoulder that you're always playing with as a surgeon, and you can't stabilize the shoulder without sacrificing a little bit of motion. And uh, sometimes the scarring that does occur can be a little excessive, and that will lead to to stiffness, but it generally doesn't always cause pain. So to that viewer or that uh, question uh, writer, I would suggest that you go in and get it re-examined in an x-ray. Hopefully there's not any arthritis that's progressing, but it sounds kind of like that's maybe what's happening to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, the next question that we have uh, from a viewer is, what is, the, what is the success rate of PRP in treating torn, and I'm not going to get the pronunciation right, so you can correct this for me, um, supraspinitis tendon versus surgery? Uh, <laughs> that, so PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Okay. And the supraspinatus is just one of the four muscles of the rotator cuff that is actually torn most often. And unfortunately, uh, you can't – we have to separate treatments – in uh, musculoskeletal problems into what we would term mechanical problems and chemical problems, biochemical problems. So when a tendon like the rotator cuff tears, there's a signal that's being sent to the tissues around it that make the nerves and those tissues a little more hypersensitive, and that's why there's usually pain being caused. 
But in addition, there's a loss of some of the tendon surface area. And so you now you have a lot of the tendon that's supposed to be doing work that can't anymore because the surrounding tissues have to make up for it. <laughs> PRP, at this point in time, putting platelets that come from your bloodstream into a musculoskeletal injury controls inflammation. It does not heal tendons. It does not treat the mechanical portion of your tear. It only treats the inflammation portion of your tear. So the success rate, it's hard to compare cuff repairs versus PRP. A full thickness tear using PRP is likely not going to be as successful as if, when you put it into what we call a partial thickness tear where only a portion of that supraspinatus tendon has been torn. So you're, you're comparing a little bit of apples and oranges. When we compare PRP, a better comparison is to steroid injections because that's basically trying to accomplish the same thing, but the PRP is using your own natural cells. The, the, the choice that most patients are making right now is based financially off of those two choices because steroids are covered by your insurance, whereas PRP is a cash pay right now for that particular problem. Okay. So if you were going to compare PRP and steroids, which would be a little bit better than doing cuff repair comparison, I think that in my experience and in our office's experience, they're, they're equivalent. And we're starting to see that people with the PRP and even stem cells, I might, I might add we also use stem cells for the same purpose, um, there's, there's a slight advantage, I think, in the cells. The problem we're having is there's just not as many of those patients to compare them to. So there's a lot, it's a lot more anecdotal, meaning we, we call the patient once or twice, and then maybe we don't see them for six months to a year, and, we, and we're kind of just assuming that they're not coming back because their symptoms have resolved. So it's a tough comparison at this point. In fact, that's likely why insurances aren't paying for things like the cellular treatments yet, because we just don't have that information to give to people. I will, I will add that you need to be very cautious when seeking out providers who do these cellular treatments. Uh, PRP only comes from your body, but stem cells can be harvested from your body or they can be prepackaged, like from amniotic fluid. So be very careful about which ones you're using. Uh, try to do your research, know who your provider is, be very, very cautious about who you choose because there are a lot of people who will overcharge and provide you with a product that may not be as good as the ones that we can harvest from yourself. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for that information. Um, the next question that we have from a viewer is, my recent MRI diagnosed me with two full thickness, thickness tears and up to 3.7 centimeters of retraction, also a slap tear. Options, what options does this viewer have um, to have arthroscopic reattachments? Uh, so those are really, that's really good information. There are a couple of points there that we look at when we're talking about cuff repair, that whether it's possible or not. I think that's a hot topic uh, because of a newer implant that's been shown to be very predictable. It's called a reverse shoulder replacement. And one of its uses is to fix shoulders that you can't repair the rotator cuff on. So I'll just give you some quick points that we think of as surgeons as to whether somebody can actually heal a rotator cuff tear. So the first one is how old is the patient? We notice that healing rates start to decline in rotator cuff repairs at the age of 65. Now, does that mean if you're 66, you can't repair your cuff? No, it's just one of the things that we think about. Um, the size of the tear. So when we talk about the size of the tear, we're talking about the front attachment of the cuff as it moves backward. Um, the rotator cuff is unlike some of the tendons in our body. It's a, like a sheet of tendon where these four muscles converge together. Unlike some of the tendons you have in your wrist or your hand, they're like little ropes. So you have to think of it more as when it's tearing, like you're opening a zipper or a Ziploc bag. It starts in the front, and as it tears, it kind of moves backwards. So the size of the tear, one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, these are all different size tears. The smaller the tear, the easier it is to heal. It's also the easier to repair. Um, so a three centimeter tear, we would call, it, call a, a moderate to a large size tear. The, the reason that is the way it is is the surface area that you're trying to heal back, the larger it is, 
the more scarring that has to occur, the more work your body has to do, and the higher chance that it won't be able to complete, completely scar back to that surface area. The other thing that we think about is how long the tear has been there, how retracted it is. Uh, rotator cuffs are very elastic. A muscle is pulling on a, a stretchy tendon, and if that tendon's been torn for 12, 18 months, a lot of time the tendon itself is so thin and kind of atrophied that you can't even get the sutures to stay in it. And the muscle itself has become so rigid that you can't pull the tendon back to where it belongs. We get an MRI not only to diagnose the tears, but to look at the quality of the muscle and the quality of the tissue that we're going to try to fix. We look at things that we call atrophy. So if a muscle is supposed to be this big in cross-sectional area and over the years you haven't fixed it it will shrink and shrivel and there at some point we have to say well it's just probably not even going to recover even if we can reattach the tendon there's also a process that occurs in rotator cuffs called fatty infiltration and you can see that on mri where the muscle fibers are being replaced by fat uh, storage deposits and that also indicates to us that it's a very unhealthy muscle that will be very difficult to repair so if your little points that I'm talking about, your age, the tear size, the length of time it's been torn, the quality of the muscle aren't adding up to a good probability that we'll be able to fix the tear, then we often talk to the patients if they're in an age range where a, rot or a reverse shoulder replacement is much more predictable. So that age is also coming down. We used to be 70 years old, we'd say, you know, we probably should wait until someone turns that to 70 before using this replacement. But there is ongoing research and evidence that people as young as 60 do very well with those. And so if I get someone who's in their mid 60s with a bad looking tear, we often will talk about a reverse replacement because it's much more predictable. You only have to be immobilized for a short period of time, two weeks versus six or eight weeks. And usually at six months, people with reverse replacements are off and going and they're back to life. And people with bad cuffs that are very difficult to repair, I'd say 50% of them are back in the office with a re-tear. And the other half are still struggling to get back to their normal behavior and their normal activities. So it's always a discussion that generates a lot of time and education for the patients just to make sure that they know what it is they're getting into and we allow them to kind of pick the surgery that they think they're willing to accept some of the risks and the benefits with because uh, each one has its own little set of problems that we have to deal with. But uh, that's, that's a tough question, and uh, that's one, as you just witnessed, takes a lot of time and energy to evaluate. So uh, good luck with the tear. Hopefully it's repairable. Okay, and again, um, for this viewer who asked this question, if you would like to get in with Dr. Richardson to get you know a full consultation and, and have him um, work with you um, um, on this, um, feel free to call and schedule an appointment with him, um, and he'll be more than happy to help you however he can. Um, the other thing, you mentioned reverse shoulder replacement. Could you go talk a little bit about what that is exactly, maybe compared to um, shoulder, a full shoulder replacement? Or partial. Right, so there's two types of shoulder replacements. Uh, the reverse replacement, <laughs> we get a lot of people asking me if we put their arm on backwards <laughs> or if they have to you know, walk around on their hands. But uh, what it means is in our normal anatomy, the humerus, which is the bone that goes from the shoulder to the elbow, has a ball on it. And the scapula, which is the other half of the joint, usually has the socket on it. The reverse replacement merely switches those orientations so that the socket is placed on the humerus and the ball or hemisphere is attached to where the socket used to be on the scapula. Why do we do that? Well, the rotator cuff is a set of muscles that doesn't really rotate. It's more of a stabilizer. So when enough of that cuff is torn and retracted and not repairable, what ends up happening is every time you try to raise your arm, the ball slides up in the socket because the cuff's job is really to keep the ball centered in the socket. It's a stabilizing set of muscles. They're not super big or powerful. They don't generate a lot of force. So every time you raise your arm, if the cuff is deficient, it creates the shearing motion on your socket. And if left alone for long enough, that develops into an arthritic condition and the two, a rotator cuff plus arthritis is something we call cuff tear arthropathy. And that was a problem we couldn't solve with standard anatomic replacements. And so 
over the last 30 years, there's been this huge development and movement towards the reverse replacements, and it solves that problem. And in fact, we've now expanded its, you know, usage uh, in other issues too. Anything that leaves you with a deficient rotator cuff, a fracture, a revision, ro a revision shoulder replacement, a cuff that's not repairable, uh, dislocations that you know can't be solved in any other way. Uh, we've expanded the use of that and we're seeing good results and uh, people are doing really well with the reverse replacement. So the other type of replacement is a standard what we call anatomic replacement. So in that situation where the ball and socket uh, are in a normal anatomy, exactly what we do is we remove the arthritic surfaces of the ball and place a metal ball there and we resurface the socket because your rotator cuff is working appropriately. Now I may add, Michael, if it's okay, uh, just a little bit about some of the advances in that procedure. Absolutely. That was my mind went right there as well. So okay. please. So the implants in the standard anatomic replacement, we used to have these stems that we'd put into the humerus that were roughly four inches long. Over the last five years, we've been able to narrow them to about two inches long. And then in their most recent uh, advance, we now call these implants stemless because they're so, so short that they don't even go down into the canal of the bone. And that has led to the ability to then think about the approach or uh, limiting another complication of an anatomic replacement. When we go into the shoulder through the front, we have to remove one of those healthy rotator cuff muscles to access the joint, do our work, and then at, at the end of the surgery, we have to repair that. That's called the subscapularis. And every conference I've been to in my training, there's always a discussion about how do you handle the subscapularis because if it doesn't heal back, the shoulder replacement is pretty much useless. It dislocates and it causes a lot of pain. People can't really get much relief from that. So if there's a way to perform that surgery without removing the subscapularis, that would be a huge advancement. The reason people stay in their slings for so long after an anatomic replacement is six weeks is because you're waiting for that to heal back. Now a reverse replacement, the way that I perform it, we don't have to repair the subscapularis and so people are in their slings for only two weeks. Wouldn't it be nice to move those shoulder replacements anatomically to that same sort of limited sling wear and they could get back to their life a lot faster? So there's been some recent advancements and they're still working on that. Some of it has to do with robotics but some of it also has to do with the approach. So I went most recently, it was like three weeks ago, down to meet with a gentleman, another surgeon down in Cincinnati who has developed a, an approach that he's doing really well with. And uh, so he trained me on how to do that. And currently I'm the only one between here in LA, Los Angeles, between Cincinnati and Los Angeles who's performing those procedures. So we take somebody from a shoulder replacement and mobilizing for six weeks down to six days and they're out and moving their shoulder within that time frame. So that I think is one of the most uh, intriguing advancements in shoulder replacement as of this year and uh, I'm super excited to be able to provide that to anyone in our region uh, including those you know in other parts of Idaho and Boise or you know Twin Falls, Burley, Jerome, those areas. Uh, we've already had some interest in the in that procedure, just in in letting people know that we're performing it. That's excellent, Dr. Richardson. Thank you very much for um, for talking about that. I I really appreciate it. Um, another question that just came in from one of our viewers is, will I lose my range of motion after surgery, or will I have to sacrifice um, doing some of the activities I used to enjoy? Uh, Maybe tricky to answer. Did they did they mention which surgery they're referring to? S some surgeries are a little more prone to having stiffness in their shoulder afterwards. Let's go with um, I'm I would assume so let's go with shoulder replacement. A replacement. Yeah. Um, so when any time that we put metal and plastic into your body in order to resurface your joint, there's going to be some limitations. So when we talk about the results of a shoulder replacement. We often talk about getting two thirds or you lose one third of the normal motion that you typically would have had before. So it's not like we're putting in a brand new shoulder where you go back to when you were 16 and throwing baseballs and footballs <laughs> and things like that. It is a pain relieving operation that allows for you to have a somewhat better function 
but it, you're, there, are, there are three things I found that I would say certainly don't do after a shoulder replacement. Number one is bench press. You know, you go to the gym and you throw up these weights. That, that's kind of a no-no. Have I had patients doing that? Yes. Yikes. Should they be doing it? It really worries me. Uh, the other one is very similar to that, so push-ups. We try to have you avoid doing any of those. Oh. And then I had um, a patient in the Caribou County area who was a cement worker. He owned a cement company, and he asked me if he could use a jackhammer for breaking up cement, and I said, eh, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> so those are the three things after a replacement that I often tell people not to do. There are some surgeons in the country after a reverse replacement who try to put a weight restriction on it, like 20, 25 pounds. I don't usually do that. I just ask my patients to listen to their shoulders and they usually are told by their own shoulder what it will or will not do. So we've got shoulder replacements, playing golf, hunting, riding horses, back on the farm. I've got one who's a professor of um, wilderness survival here in the region, and he's he's been back doing that on his own, you know, camping out in the middle of nowhere. I have miners who are panning and digging for gold. I mean, we've got all sorts of things that people do after their shoulder replacements that are very, very um, active and entertaining. But those three things I often tell them not to do. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richardson. And thank you for elaborating on the types of patients you see. I have the impression that sometimes when people hear about an orthopedic surgeon, they may, for some reason, just only think that orthopedic surgeons um, see um, athletes, when in fact you see people of all ages um, and help with a variety of different um, issues. That's correct, right? Yeah. So as a shoulder surgeon, I mean, there's pathology of your shoulder all throughout your entire life. Uh, So I treat a spectrum of that. If you are a dedicated athletic sports surgeon, a lot of times you do a lot of things through cameras, and those are often treated you know, in a younger population. But when we have arthritis, uh, dislocations, rotator cuff tears, those can be in a later age, usually once they're you know, 65 or older. So there's a lot of people in, that, you know, in, their, in their retirement years who need shoulder work because they're just worn out. Okay. And the other thing I was going to ask you about is, I guess really the way that I want to say it is, how is it that someone would know if they need to schedule an appointment to come and see you? For example, with the shoulder or with the elbow, I imagine it could be a little bit difficult to, for someone to think, oh, something's wrong with my shoulder or I'm just wondering how the pain, how people, what people commonly come to you with, what ailments, what kind of, um, what kind of ailments and how, how do they present so that if someone is experiencing that and maybe think, oh, maybe I just have a knot in my shoulder or kind of keep taking over-the-counter pain medications for, for pain, um, how would someone know if they, they're having problems with their shoulder? I imagine you would know, but how would you know if you were having well, problems? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. So 100% of people come because of pain, but pain is not what we're looking for as an orthopedic surgeon. We're looking for mechanical things that we can fix. So what I'm assessing when somebody comes into the office, and you can think about this at home, is whether you have weakness in things that you're trying to accomplish, whether you have stiffness that seems excessive, and the other is mechanical instability. So if your ball and your socket seem to be slopping around, if the end of your clavicle isn't stable and it's shifting and popping and clicking, those are all things that we can solve. Pain can be caused by a lot of different things. In fact, all the nerves that run from your neck to your hand travel through your shoulder. And so there's often pain syndromes that we can't mechanically do anything about as shoulder surgeons. So I am looking, and people can assess this at home, surgery really solves those mechanical issues. We can do things other than surgery for things that are just causing pain that aren't necessarily a mechanical solution. So if you have weakness, if you can't raise your arm up, if you can't lift a, a gallon of milk, if you can't uh, hold things that you normally would hold, if your weights on your right hand are less than the weights on your left hand because things are just feeling different, those are the kind of things that we can solve. So if you have pain and weakness, that's usually a pretty heralding event when you start having weakness. Stiffness. Stiffness is caused mainly from loss of motion. I mean, that's the same sort of synonymous word. So if your shoulder can't move the way it once did, if you can't get to your back pocket, if you can't raise your arm overhead because it just won't get there, 
those are things that we can solve generally too. And then instability, which is usually somebody knows they have instability because they've dislocated their shoulder and it's not a, that one's typically not too unclear because they come in with a history of saying it just won't stay in place or I've got this sloppy shoulder that um, hurts a lot. I will tell you that uh, one of the unique groups are young athletes who just have shoulder pain who are doing a lot of overhead things. And I found a lot of that here in, in Idaho, something called multidirectional instability. Uh, I see it a lot in swimmers. We see it a lot in throwers. I see it a lot in cheerleaders. Um, and that's a more difficult problem because they may not have had a dislocation, but yet they have loosey goosey ligaments okay. that just lead to the ball and socket not being able to stay, you know, connected to one another. And so this ball of your shoulder slopping around in the socket and it causes pain. So we do a lot of therapy to help solve that, but it eventually, uh, a, a large number of those people can't solve it that way. And so we have to do surgery on them. So if you're a young athlete, does a lot of overhead, and you have one shoulder that just isn't feeling well, you had a minor injury to it that never got better, that could possibly be a thing. And, that, and, and that, that's a genetic-related problem that we can't change your genes, but we can hopefully tighten your shoulder enough and it'll stay you know, stable for a while you need it to perform. Um, that, Michael, is interesting because I've seen a lot more of that here in Idaho than I have in other places that I've trained in Virginia or even in Arizona. Is there any reason for that, or is it just be? I mean, because those activities exist elsewhere as well. It's a problem everywhere. I'm, I'm just telling you from my own personal oh. experience, I've seen a lot of it here. Uh, and it being genetic, you know, it may oh. just be that there's some families that have that within their genes that, you know, are just getting passed around. So I don't know. I can't explain it to you. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, the other thing that I was going to ask you that kind of maybe piggybacks on this a little bit is I imagine people are afraid of coming to see you, not because of you, you <laughs> but because I don't know, because of their condition. Um, I think they put off on, they put off or procrastinate um, coming to, to get an exam from you if they're experiencing shoulder pain, for example. Um, but I know that I've heard so many other orthopedic surgeons say that, that the fears that, you, that patients or prospective patients have that surgery or treat different, tr there are so many different treatments it doesn't, that they don't have to automatically think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have shoulder surgery. There, I know that there are so many other treatments that you, um, you try first before you get to surgery, before you get to surgery. Um, what are some of the reasons why people really procrastinate coming to see you if they're in severe pain in their shoulder? <laughs> or is that, am I making that up? Um, what are some reasons why people choose not to address their surgical problems? Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest reason is, like you said, I mean, it's fear. We're going to, when we talk about surgery, we're causing pain. We're doing surgery that we have to invade your body in some way and alter it. So I think it's a healthy thing. I think people should be somewhat concerned about their surgery. And that's not necessarily like the outcomes of the surgery, like after it's healed and whatnot, but we are we have gotten so good at anesthesia that i think some people forget that it can still be dangerous there can still be things that go wrong with your heart or your brain or your lungs or your kidneys like we're pretty good at it but it can still be detrimental so there's risks anytime we put somebody to sleep there's risks anytime we operate on them you know infection is always a risk so we have never been able to get rid of all bacteria or viruses in the world. So, I mean, there are things that can go wrong with surgery. And so I think it's healthy to have a little bit of apprehension about it. Um, maybe your viewer is more, or your question is more along the lines of, should I have a knee replacement when I'm 55 or a shoulder replacement when I'm 60 versus 70? Should I live a decade in pain or should I have surgery to solve that problem and accept some of the consequences maybe later in life? I have that conversation all the time with somebody about replacements, especially, and there's no real good clear answer with that. Um, I usually just give the patient the information and, and, and let them make that choice themselves because I am the surgeon and it doesn't hurt me at all to do the surgery, but the patient then has to live with, you know, the consequences or the, you know, risks that come with having metal and plastic in your body, which can be devastating at times. So. We are really good at what we do, but we're not 100% perfect. So I think that's where people's apprehension comes from. They may have heard of a bad outcome from a friend, 
and uh, that can really be concerning, and I think that's okay. And part of my job as a surgeon is to kind of help alleviate some of that by giving them a broader understanding of what the experience is of more patients. But, you know, if I were going to have surgery, I'd have a little apprehension about it too. Okay, thanks, Dr. Richardson. I think maybe to elaborate on that a little bit as well, that people may or may not know who are watching um, that it's not just a matter of, you know, you come in and you're diagnosed and you have to go right into surgery, you know, right away, or maybe there are such accidents or certain situations where that is the case. But if it's something that's planned ahead of time, um, that Dr. Richardson does offer pre-op or pre-op classes or classes that um, all of his patients are required to take before they actually have surgery. And it actually talks to the, the patients. It's a really intense, um, intensive class that provides a lot of really great in- information to reassure patients um, about what is my sur- what my surgery is going to look like, what it's going to look like, what's going to happen the day, what do I need to do before the, the surgery, what do I need to do the day of the surgery, um, and then there's tons of information that's provided um, on all the safety precautions and safety measures um, that Dr. Richardson wants his patients to take um, after surgery. So that's, there's, it's a very all-inclusive um, that his team um, basically hold the patient's hand all the way through just to calm or assuage any fears, um, just so they're very uh, 100% clear about um, what to expect um, before, during, and after. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on about that, Dr. Richardson? I know that's a big part of your program that your patients speak very highly of. Well, I think you're referring to our uh, orthopedic expedition class, which is typically for our hip replacements and knee replacements. Oh, okay. Um, Things like outpatient surgeries, the education is usually done by me and my nurse, uh, my PA. Uh, We don't really have a class for some of those simpler things like rotator cuff repairs or instability procedures, but Anytime you have a joint replacement, I mean, it is a chore to get you through the hospital and out safely. And then a lot of people, you know, like you said, have a lot of questions before and after. And it can be very confusing and, and frustrating for some, time, for some patients. So that whole class that's been developed is something that's kind of done nationwide in most centers. And um, it is informational. It's to help you alleviate some of the questions and fears that may you may have about procedural things or these strange people coming in and out of your rooms, like what are they supposed to do for you and how are they involved in your care? So you get to meet some of them um, before you get to see them in the hospital. And I think that does help quite a few patients feel more comfortable about it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, One of the last questions that we have from our viewers, um, from a viewer is, this is a little long, so kind of bear with me. and we'll kind of get to the crux of, of the question. Okay. My physical therapist believes I have adhesive cap, capsu, capsulitis. Capsulitis, yeah. Frozen shoulder. Okay, frozen frozen shoulder. Um, I have been having pain since at least March. There was no known injury. And my most recent HA1C was 5.8. So they're not diabetic. Um, and they're not postmenopausal. I have a very limited range of motion in my shoulder. Unable to reach up to fix my hair. Um, it hurts to reach into the back seat of the car or to reach behind my back or to put a shirt on. What treatment options are there if this is adhesive capsulitis? And how long is an average course of adhesive capsulitis? It's going to make me say it a lot. Um, I hope, and I'm hoping for a non surgical approach. So, how would you respond to that question? Uh, so, if that is the diagnosis, uh, we'll, we'll make it easier on Michael. We'll just call it frozen <laughs> shoulder. Um, <laughs> most people recognize it as that and that's what it is it's a shoulder that's extremely stiff it's one of the two major reasons for people to get shoulder stiffness the other being arthritis Uh, and it's an interesting condition because we don't know what causes it we we uh, used to think that diabetics which is why she mentions the a1c uh, had a higher propensity for it but recent research has shown that we don't really know if that's a you know correlated or not so we don't know what causes it, which makes treating it a little bit difficult. Uh, but we also know that it's a self-limiting disease, meaning that it will go away eventually, but that eventually can take up to two years for it to thaw out and loosen up on its own. So if you can tolerate it for that long, then you can be rest assured that eventually it'll, it'll loosen if that's actually what it is. Now, there are, there are two types of adhesive capsulitis. The primary adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is what I just described, self-limited, no known cause, 
Somebody wakes up one morning, their shoulder's hurting, and then over you know a few weeks it stiffens. It's very painful. Uh, it's difficult to get it moving again. And it comes in three phases. Now, you have to forgive us orthopedists. We're incredibly smart, but we like to dumb it down so that we can remember everything. <laughs> the first phase is something we call the freezing phase. And then there's this frozen phase, which is stiffness but less pain. And then thawing phase, which is generally just a longer term and it's less painful and the motion just generally comes back. So depending on how long the patient that is asking this question has suffered from this, you can kind of determine which phase they're in. We don't do any intervention, surgical or non-surgical, during the freezing phase because it just makes things worse. But during the frozen phase, you try to maintain the amount of motion that is there. And usually that's a physical therapy type thing which can be done with a therapist or at home. We often will inject them with steroids. There are a couple of intra-office procedures that I've read about recently. Tried it one time, not sure I like it, but uh, you may hear somebody call something called hyperdilation, which is where we numb up the shoulder, stick a very large needle with a bunch of saline in it, and we just push until the capsule pops, and hopefully that will loosen the shoulder. Sounds awful, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not as terrible as it sounds when we do it. Uh, and and some, some people are using ozone. I've never injected that myself, but I know a lot of pain specialists are doing things like that. Um, where was I? Oh, uh, in the thawing phase, if you've reached the thawing phase where it's less painful and it's already loosening, then just let it, you know, run its course. There's really not a lot you have to do with that. So it's those people in the frozen phase, whether they can tolerate the length of time where their shoulder is trying to get through that. And that's the most frustrating phase because it is painful and it is very stiff. And so it's difficult sometimes to manage through that portion of it. But if you're, if you're mentally tough, you can usually get through it. Surgical treatments for a frozen shoulder. Oh, wait, I got to go back. We talked about primary. The secondary frozen shoulder, um, this is a little more tricky because what happens is something else is wrong with the shoulder, a rotator cuff tear, a slap tear, a dislocated AC joint or shoulder where the patient just kind of supports the arm and doesn't want to use it then it gets stiff. That's something that comes as a secondary cause because the patient doesn't want to use it. That is usually very treatable because if you treat the underlying problem, then the shoulder can start moving again, it's less painful, and that goes away a lot quicker, usually within three to four months after you've treated the underlying problem with the shoulder. So you have to decipher which type of shoulder, uh, sorry, a frozen shoulder that you're dealing with first. Surgical treatments for primary frozen shoulder are, they're somewhat barbaric. <laughs> oh, gosh. So because this tissue we call the capsule, which is why they call it capsulitis, is usually very thin and pliable, it's stretchy. The problem in that condition is it gets very thick and rigid. So we can take it to the operating room and force the shoulder to go where it belongs after putting it to sleep. And it does make these audible sounds of popping, crunching, cracking, uh, but it usually gets their motion back quite readily. Then they go immediately into physical therapy after that to try to maintain the motion that they've, you know, we've achieved in the operating room. So not a lot of really great advancements on the frozen shoulder side of things, but, you know, people are trying new things all the time. I would just be cautious about, like I said, who's injecting you with what they're injecting you. You just have to be careful that it's a safe sort of procedure for them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richardson, um, for answering that question for our viewer. And, you know, for our viewer, if you're not seeing, imagine you're not currently seeing Dr. Richardson, but um, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with him um, to further discuss this and treatment options, um, I would highly um, recommend um, scheduling an appointment um, with Dr. Richardson. Um, so we are at the end of the question of the viewer questions. Um, I thought this has been a really great conversation, and I hope that our viewers have been able to learn um, a lot of things that they might not have known or things that are potential that could potentially help them. In our conversation, Dr. Richardson, is there anything else that you would like to elaborate on? Um, talk about things that you haven't that you treat um, but weren't able to talk about today, or anything else that you would like to or any of our viewers to know about you or your um, pr your practice? Uh, I think that what I'd love for people to understand is that. Southeast Idaho is not 
you know, isolated anymore. We've got excellent uh, sur surgeons here in the area. We've got some of the best in the region here in the area. So don't consider traveling too far to get things done that can be accomplished right here in your, in your own neighborhood. Um, I hear a lot of times people are being referred to bigger cities like Boise and Salt Lake City because the surgeons may not know that they have a specialist like myself here in town. Um, things like revisions or very complicated fractures of the shoulder are often being sent down. Uh, complicated problems like a nasty infection of a joint replacement. I know these things are being sent other places, but uh, make sure you understand that we have excellent surgeons and great outcomes in our own little you know, region of Southeast Idaho. And as I mentioned, we're doing things here you know, at the hospital in Blackfoot that aren't being done anywhere between Cincinnati and Los Angeles. So have confidence in who we are and what we can do, and we, we do take great care of you. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for sharing that. And it's absolutely true. Um, it's something that um, our CEO, and Jake Erickson, and all of our um, doctors take great pride in. We, um, we take great pride in providing what I consider to be the best health, rural health care um, in the region. Um, we are strive, all of our doctors and all of our nurses and staff, um, our number one priority or their number one priority is to, pl to provide high quality and compassionate health care. Um, and the other aspect of Bingham Healthcare that people may not know of is it's really kind of a Mayo Clinic model as well because we have all these primary, or we have um, a large majority of primary um, healthcare physicians or primary doctors, uh, family doctors, and then they have a huge network of specialists um, all the way from migraine specialists, hip replacements, sur or orthopedic surgeons for hip replacements, knee replacements. Um, we have pulmonologists, respiratory doctors, um, the gamut. We have a, a large majority that we were bringing specifically to this region so people don't actually have to leave eastern Idaho to go somewhere else to have um, their to have their medical conditions treated. Um, and if you go to binghammemorial.org, you can look under um, physician specialties and you can see all the different specialties and you can learn about all the different providers that we have in this area. And one of the reasons or a couple of the reasons that we've brought all these providers or all these providers have come to, to eastern Idaho to work at Bingham Healthcare is the fact that um, we want to, to we want you to save you time so you don't have to travel and go out of state or go somewhere else to be able to have something done that can be done here. And the other thing is um, we want to save you money. There's a lot of money that you people have to spend to be able to go outside of this area to have procedures done when you could save a lot of money by just actually staying here. So if you ever have any questions about any of our specialties or any of what anything that our providers do, just always be sure to ask or even call. Um, you can call our general number at 208-785-4100, again, 208 um, 785-4100 and you can ask the operator um, to, re to have you connected to, to, a, to a provider to ask them, hey, if, you, if someone else recommended or referred that you leave the state or go somewhere else, you could call us and get a second consultation and say, do you, do you have a provider that would perform X, Y, and Z? And they could connect you and that's the easiest way to learn um, about what all of our doctors do. And again, you know, with Dr. Richardson in particular, there's a lot of things that he does um, <clears throat> that, you know, that you can, that you can stay in town and, um, and not have to travel outside of the area. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, Dr. Richardson, is I don't know, are you still doing um, or participating in telehealth medicine for your, any of your patients? I am, yeah, actually. Uh, I am. So, yes, the answer is yes. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing that we were kind of forced into that during the COVID quarantine. But what I discovered by using telehealth is I can reach out to a larger audience. So, uh, I know in particular there was a gentleman in Utah who had a rotator cuff tear and he wanted to get it fixed, but they had some sort of six-week moratorium where no elective surgeries could be performed. And so he reached out to me because his brother lives in our area, and we did our entire initial visit over telehealth because he was pretty savvy and he knew how to share his screen and so I could see his MRI, and we talked about his symptoms. He went through some of the you know, um, exams that we do. There were some that we couldn't do because sometimes you have to touch a patient in order to figure that out. But it was enough that I could tell that, yes, he needed surgery for his rotator cuff. Uh, and so he had planned to come up and have it done. But in the meantime, uh, the moratorium was lifted. The, uh, 
he was able to squeeze into one of their outpatient surgery centers down there. So it was, um, it was a very interesting tool. And, and what that has led me to discover is that we can reach out further and further than our own region. So we're actually trying to reach into the Treasure Valley and Magic Valley areas to let people know that we have these new shoulder replacement procedures. Uh, certainly, um, you don't have to be in your sling. And if you're waiting six, 12 months for a surgery in those regions, come on over. We can do it same day. You could stay one night either before or after the surgery and go home and be out of your sling. All of the therapy is minimal then because there's not really a heavy risk on you know rupturing those repairs that we do. And we can still continue to follow most patients uh, through the telehealth um, technology where they can do therapy at their own local area and we can just call them at our regular scheduled visits. They can get x-rays taken in their own local area and that can be sent to us. So it, it's uh, expanding our ability to reach out to other populations in other areas of Idaho and it's, it's pretty exciting. I know just recently we had uh, even a patient out of Northern Utah who his friend also had had surgery with me and he came and had a surgery because he felt like there was some confidence there that wasn't in his local area. So we, we have the ability to do all of that and it's pretty exciting. Sometimes the innovations that occur out of necessity and it, it's pretty cool. I really, I really do like that telehealth uh, option for people. That's great. I'm really glad um, to know that you're participating in that um, or in that you've been using that really actively. So just for your the viewers out there, just so you know that Dr. Richardson is accepting telehealth visits. If you may not know what that is, it's actually where you can have an appointment with him over the phone or um, over the computer. Yeah, um, it's usually a computer connection. And I think recently they just approved Apple FaceTime as a secured network. Don't quote me on that, but that's just a rumor that I've heard. So it's pretty easy to use. Uh, I did notice during the quarantine that some of our older patients had a hard time with the connections, but we do have people in our office who will reach out to them and help them through that process so that we can have a good quality visit. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I think that we've reached the end of the webinar. I really appreciate everyone who's been watching this um, this webinar, and I really appreciate uh, all of the questions um, that our viewers have asked. There have been some really fantastic questions today. Um, Again, Dr. Richardson, he sees patients through telehealth, if that's um, convenient for you. Um, the other, he also sees patients at the Physicians and Surgeons Clinic of Pocatello in, in Pocatello off of 1151 Hospital Way. Um, and to schedule an appointment or to for more information about Dr. Richardson, you can call 208-239-8000. Again, 208-239-8000. Um, he also sees a patient's, um, patients throughout the month um, in Soda Springs um, at the Caribou uh, Memorial Hospital as a, visit, as a visiting specialist. Um, and... Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, if again, if you want more information about Dr. Richardson, you can go to www.binghammemorial.org, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of information on there. Um, at this point, Dr. Richardson, thank you very much for being here and for answering our viewers' quest view, Thanks, our viewers questions. It's been my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Um, and at this time, um, I would just like to say um, for everyone at Bingham Healthcare, we hope that you continue to stay happy, healthy, and safe in all that you do.